Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to your next day in the C programming language. In this lesson, I'm going to be talking about function pointers. I'm going to be talking about where they're used, what their purpose is, and just this idea that functions, well, they have an address too, so we should be able to point to them. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in here. So again, today I'm going to be talking about function pointers. And I think the easiest way to get started is to just go ahead and write an example code which has some function in it. So I'm going to go ahead and open a uh, main C file here. And let's just go ahead and set up our basic program here. So we'll have a return zero. And maybe we want some utility functions in our standard IO to print things off. And let's just go ahead and create a simple function here that's going to add two integers, a and b, maybe something similar that we've seen in our very first day of C programming. And we'll continue from here. Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead and just compile this program here. So in a way, we're going to make sure that we haven't made any mistakes. So GCC, I like compiling with the debug symbols, dash G, and then this main program, and I'll just output it as prog. So no problem so far. Now, what's kind of interesting here is if I go ahead and instead of just compile the program directly, I could output the assembly. So instead, I'll just do GCC-S and the main C program here. And that's going to create this file called main.s for us, which is the assembly form. So let's go ahead and take a little closer look at this, and maybe you'll understand the purpose here of why I'm doing this. Now, as I'm looking at the assembly, and you don't have to be an assembly programmer to look at this, notice that at line 5, I do see some sort of add function here. So the actual assembly code that gets generated from our C source files that are compiled actually end up getting translated to this assembly and then the associated machine instructions for our architecture. Now again, why do we care about this? Well, I'm just trying to show you the point that this add function must live somewhere. And if it must live somewhere, there must be storage for it. And that means add must have an address. So it's represented here as a label and assembly, but we can also just see the function name here. So allow me to perhaps close the assembly view and give you another view of add here. So let me go ahead and clear this terminal. And if you're following along on Linux, you can try running with this really cool tool called objdump which is a way to display information from object files. So what's an object file? Well, prog, for instance, is an example of an object file, some sort of binary file that's executable. So what I'm going to do here is run objump dash T, which represents the symbol table, and then our prog as input here. And let me go ahead and just scroll through this a little bit. And let's see again if we can find anything interesting here. Now we might have to search for a little bit here. And in fact, it'll be a little bit easier if I shrink the fonts down a little bit. And let's just go ahead and see if we see some symbol, which is what I'm printing out here, representing at. So I'll go ahead and just run this tool so things are uh, aligned. And without changing anything, I can again see that this add symbol shows up. And you can actually see the addresses of where these things live or are represented. So again, that's the idea here of what's going on. Again, this function has to be stored somewhere. Now, if you don't care about doing this deep dive, let's just go ahead and do a little bit more of a pragmatic example here, where I just go ahead and print f the address of the add function here. So like we've learned before, in our previous lessons where we've worked with pointers here, address of, and let me just do this with ampersand, add equals, and since it's an address, we're doing percent %p, and we'll take the address of add here. And let's go ahead and compile this program and see what it gives us here. I'll run back to our GCC, run prog, and you can see the actual address where this add function lives, which is pretty cool. And that's getting to, well, the point of this lesson here with function pointers. So what function pointers are is the ability to store a function address of a specific function signature. Okay, and what I mean by function signature, well, let me go ahead and look at our add function here. The signature or the declaration of this function is the signature. It's got a name, 
it takes in two input values, two integers, and it returns a integer value here. So why is this useful or what's the point? Well, we can encapsulate or hold. I can just say in terms of C, the behavior of a function in a pointer. And this is a really powerful idea, especially if you're coming from a language and to the series, say if you've done some Java or C++ programming or Swift or Python, other languages where you have classes. In C, we don't have that, this ability to rather have within a user-defined type the ability to execute functions or sort of associate those functions, that is the actions with the data. So instead, in C, we just have structs. So with that said, we can use function pointers to build an object-oriented style programming. But before we get to that, which we will later in this video, so hang along in the video if you'd like to see that, let's just go ahead and see how to use a function pointer. Okay, so I've got the address of a function here, add. And let me go ahead and make this program just a little bit more interesting by giving us another function here. I'm just going to call it multiply. And instead of adding the two numbers, we'll multiply the two numbers. So two different functions, but notice that the signatures of each of these functions match here, where they're each taking in two integers and returning an integer. That's going to be important for our function pointer. All right, so how do we actually create a function pointer? So create a function pointer here. Well, let's take a look here. What we're actually going to do is we're going to do something sort of similar to what we did with pointers. We're going to look at something that we're returning here. And so part of our declaration is going to be this asterisk here because we're working with a pointer. So that's part of the declaration. So this is how we did things with pointers before, whether we had the asterisk with int or without. Now I'm going to separate things out a little bit here because what this int actually represents is the return type of the type of function that we are storing. And then we're going to give a name here. So I'm just going to call this uh, function pointer. And sometimes you'll see this as pfn for pointer to a function um, in code here. So p function, but pfn is often the abbreviation. So I'm going to use that. And then the argument list here. So that's what we have here. So this is our function pointer. Now we have to point it to something. So perhaps the address of add, for instance. Okay, and then let's actually do something here. So I'm going to use printf and let's add two numbers 2 plus 7 equals the result of, well, which function are we going to call here? We could call add explicitly or we can access the add function through our function pointer here. So I'm going to use pfn 2 and 7 and let's go ahead and see if this compiles and runs here. So it compiles. And if I run it, it indeed runs here. So let's just go ahead and take a moment to sort of stare at this for a moment. And we can see again that we're printing off the address of add here. And then the result of 2 plus 7 equals, and then here's our result. Well, we're calling our function pointer because our function pointer points to add here. Okay. Now, this is a little bit interesting in what's going on here because typically when we've wanted to return a value, we've maybe dereferenced or done these kind of things. So let's see if we can do that in C. Um, we actually don't have to do that because we're not returning um, a pointer from this function. So there's nothing to dereference. So uh, there's no need to put any asterisks or stars or anything like that. So those are the types of errors that you'll get. So again, just running this, you'll see two plus seven equals nine here. But again, how are we getting that? Well, we're pointing PFN to add here. And actually, depending on your compiler, you can usually just directly assign to add here without putting the address. Usually I'll put the address just to be explicit um, in my uh, style here. Again, it'll do the same exact thing here. Okay, so now we want to see what the actual power of this is, though, because, well, I've just put PFN here. Well, if I wanted, I could just change what I'm pointing to and instead point to multiply here. And I'll make this uh, just a little bit bigger here so that you can see that we have our multiply function. 
And since it matches the signature of add here, our function pointer, pfn, can indeed point to this. All right, so let's go ahead and give this a try here. So I'll recompile. And whoops, looks like I just misspelled it here. Multiply. Because these functions have to exist. And then I'll run it. And this time, well, 2 plus 7 does not equal 14. 2 times 7 equals 14. Okay, because we've changed our function here. So we've got to actually update our print statement here. And we can see our result. All right, so this is pretty neat here that we have these function pointers. And let me go ahead and just take us to the whiteboard here just to, again, show how we create them. So uh, I'm focusing on line 17 here where I'll have the uh, int and then star pfn and then int int here. So just to show what's going on, this is the return type. This is our name. And we have the star here because, um, let me give myself a little bit more room here, because we are initializing a pointer. Okay, remember when we did int star or float star or whatever the data type is, we had the star there. Okay, and these are the arguments. And this whole thing in total makes what is the function signature or the types of things that we can point to with pfn here. Okay, and again, we could give this another name, but we can just think of this as a pointer to a function here. Okay, so that's the idea and what is going on with function pointers. Now, if I'm going to have a bunch of different types that I want to point to, I'll need some different function pointers. Now, again, you might say, Mike, what is the point of this program? Why not just directly call add or multiply here? Why have a function point to something? Well, let's try to add in just a little bit more randomness into our program here. So what I'm going to do is add in the standard library and time here. And we're just going to uh, generate a random number here. So let me generate my uh, random number seed here with srand. And it's going to be null here. And let's go ahead and get rid of some of this here. And initially, I'm just going to assign our function pointer to null here. And then what I'm going to do is just have a random number generated here. So random number equals rand. And let's mod it by 2. And I'll add 1 here, something like that here. And I'm just going to say if the random number equals zero, or rather, let's do if it equals one. Otherwise, we'll do something else. So based off of what the random number is, is which function that I'm going to actually execute here. Okay, and maybe we should have a print off uh, for each of these uh, functions here, just so we can see what happens here. Okay, and let's go ahead and do maybe two plus seven here, and then two times seven. And if that's the case, we've got to assign our function pointer to add here or our function pointer to multiply, which I will spell correctly this time. OK, so let's go ahead and compile this and it works. And let me go ahead and uh, shrink the screen just a little bit again so you can see the high level code of what is going on here. So we have a function pointer. Function pointer generate a random number and do something based off of the input. Okay, so let's go ahead and just run this a few times and see what happens. So if I run my program here, two plus seven equals nine, that looks good. Two times seven equals 14. Okay, so based off of the two different executions of my program, based off of the random number, which we could think of as, say, input in this case, I'm getting different behavior in my program. And that's really a powerful idea and one of the motivations for how to use or why to use function pointers. This idea that I can change how my program's acting by just, well, reassigning the pointer during runtime when the program's actually running. And that's when I can decide, well, am I adding numbers or am I multiplying them?
So you're often going to see these sort of function pointers in event-based programs, such as, hey, when I click a button, some event must happen. And that event that could happen could be specified in a configuration file that tells you to point to the add function, multiply, or whatever function in your actual application. So that is one of the uses of function pointers and what makes them particularly powerful. And while the syntax can be a little bit strange here, in general, it's not too bad if you, one, always you can look it up, which I often have to do, um, but you can just sort of work your way from the inside. Again, remembering that you're initializing a pointer, so that's why there's a star here. This is the name of your variable, and then you have arguments, which follow after in the return type of the type of function that you're pointing to. Um, so that sort of looks normal as far as the arguments and the actual return type here. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that lesson on function pointers. Again, if function pointers were something new for you, I hope this lesson provides a valuable insight. At the least, you now understand that functions have addresses because, well, they must, they must be stored somewhere. And then you can understand how you can use function pointers to change the behavior of what a program is actually doing. I'm going to continue to show in perhaps a future lesson how to use function pointers to create a sort of object-oriented style programming. And again, this is a really powerful technique that can make some of your C code even cleaner, or perhaps if thinking in objects is the right way to solve a problem, allow you to do that in the C programming language, which you might not have thought yet you could do. So if you want to take a look at that lesson, make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss it. And if you have comments below, please feel free to comment below and I'll try to answer your questions as soon as possible. Thanks for taking the time to listen, folks, and we'll see you next time.